I'm Dr. Joe Esposito, and welcome to our podcast, For the Health of It. Remember to subscribe to our podcasts, and I'll help you naturally get well and stay well. The information presented on this program is not intended to take the place of your personal physician's advice, and it is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. Discuss this information with your own physician or healthcare provider to determine what is right for you. Are you suffering needlessly? Dr. Joe can give you advice on how to naturally get well and stay well. Dr. Joe Esposito. Hey folks, Dr. Joe Esposito here. Today we're going to be talking about women's health issues. It's an, a fun show, an important show, because a lot of people don't understand how hormones affect their bodies. We're going to do a show on men's too, so ladies, don't worry, we've got men coming up too. And I want you to understand, I'm just giving you the science behind what happens. What happens with hormones in your body? How are they affected? What happens through a menstrual cycle? Week one, week two, week three, week four. And when you understand what's happening, you're going to get a better understanding as to how you can deal with these things and what to do to make it better. In fact, I was talking to Sierra. Uh, she helps me put the shows together. And she said it was really interesting. When I was putting the show together, I learned a lot. So there's a lot of good information here you're going to pick up. But first, let's start with Head to Toe with Dr. Joe. Uh, if, you've, if you're new to the show, every, every week we do a different segment. So far we've gone through the brain, the hair, the eyes, the ears, the sinuses. This week we're going to be talking about your breath. Now, I think I might be what's called a super smeller because I smell things that nobody else smells. So I'm very aware of my own breath and I'm very aware of other people's breaths. And I always joke if I go to a party and they have food there and they're serving food with garlic, like hummus or something like that. Now, I'm a vegan. I love hummus. But I won't eat things with garlic because I know I'm going to be eating it and standing next to somebody and talking to them. You stink. So a couple of things I want you to understand. There's really two main reasons why you'll have bad breath. One, it's coming from your mouth. That's a rotten tooth. That you didn't brush your teeth. Uh, that has a certain odor to it, a certain smell. The other one, which is way more common, I find, is a digestive problem. You ever been around somebody and they kind of smell like a bathroom, trying to keep it clean? It's a family show. And they got that smell of sewer in their mouth, and you're wondering, oh my gosh, what did they eat? It's not coming from their mouth, it's coming from their gut. Your stomach's job, you've heard me talk about this before, is to take proteins and break them into amino acids. Then the food passes from your stomach into your small intestine, where your pancreas kicks in. And the pancreas produces amylase, protease, and lipase to break down, car break down carbohydrates, fats, and proteins. Then it goes a little further, and the gallbladder spits out bile and breaks down the fats. That's a normal, healthy digestive system. Most people don't have a healthy digestive system. I've been seeing patients now for about 35 years, and I, when I test my patients, about 85% of my patients have something wrong with the digestive system. Acid reflux, heartburn, burping, gas, bloating, uh, ileocecal valve is a valve between your small and large intestine. It's stuck open, it's stuck closed, and the food isn't digesting properly. So the food essentially, keep it simple, sits in your gut and it rots. And then the gases that are given off, that stinky, sore like gases, exchange through the uh, colon wall and get into the blood system. Then the gases are traveling through the blood and the gases are exchanged again in your lungs. And so that's where it's coming from. So if you or someone you know has that, that toilet breath, I don't know what else to call it, you got to look at your digestive system. Things like Dr. Joe's digestive enzymes might be very helpful. If you have acid reflux or heartburn, we need to pull the stomach down away from the diaphragm. If the stomach is up against the diaphragm, we've talked about this many times, you might have the burping and the gas and the bloating. Patients come in all the time, Dr. Joe, I eat really well. I got this big bloating thing. That's the gas building up in your colon. If we pull the stomach, adjust the stomach, my team of doctors were chiropractors, pull the stomach away from the diaphragm, now you can start to digest your food more efficiently. Then eat something raw at every meal, broccoli, cucumbers, tomatoes, avocados, because raw food has something in it called enzymes. And enzymes break down food. They help the body with inflammation. The reason you're alive is because of enzymes. Nobody talks about enzymes. But all you are is a sack of chemicals. I mean, if you broke you down to what you are, you're calcium, magnesium, boron, whatever it is, iron, you have a certain amount of chemicals in your body. What makes that chemical come alive is the enzymes. And then the nervous system controls everything. So we got to make sure the nervous system is working properly because it controls everything. We've got to make sure your digestive system is working properly. And if you do have a problem, you may want to come see us so we can actually adjust or pull your stomach away from the diaphragm. That's really important. And then you got to eat a good diet. Now, let's assume you do eat something like garlic or onions. That's going to give you bad breath. I want you to eat a big chunk of parsley. Okay, get a whole bunch of parsley, wash it off real well, and eat it. Parsley is very high in chlorophyll, and the chlorophyll can bind to those stinky chemicals in your blood, and that can help neutralize some of those smells. And another trick I use, and I use this all the time, is I use cloves. Now, cloves, you, cloves are like, you stick them in oranges and ham. Take a clove, there's a little bud on it, just break the bud off, because that'll break off in your mouth, and just put it in your mouth and suck on it. 
Now, the cloves are antibiotic, antiviral, and antifungal, so it can really help kill bacteria in your mouth, but it gives you an amazingly fresh breath. And I can do a two, three, four-hour lecture sometimes when I teach postgraduate to medical doctors, chiropractors, attorneys, whoever it is. I'll put a clove in my cheek and gum and just leave it there for two, three, four hours. When I'm done, pull it back down, suck on it, and then everybody comes up from the audience to ask questions. You have that fresh breath. So I'm a biggie on fresh breath. I like having fresh breath. And we're talking about women's hormone issues as well. Sometimes hormones can cause bad breath as well. So these are just some little tricks you might want to consider doing if you want to have fresh breath. I don't like you taking those artificial sweeteners and those candies uh, because they have uh, negative side effects. Uh, artificial sweeteners, especially aspartame, has as aspartic acid in it. Aspartic acid gets in your brain and it's an excitotoxin. It causes the brain to fire faster than it's supposed to and can cause some neurological issues like headaches and memory loss. So not a fan of artificial sweeteners. Stevia is okay, xylitol is okay, lohan is okay, monk fruit, those are all okay, but the artificial ones are bad. So instead of popping an artificial sweetener with breath freshener or gum, I'd rather you do the cloves and then get to the cause of the problem and not just treat the symptom. If you've listened to our shows before, you know that's my whole thing. Whether it's neck pain, back pain, shoulder pain, acid reflux, whatever it is, I wanna to get to the cause of your problem and treat the cause, not just treat the symptoms. And most people are very happy with that approach to healthcare. And in fact, a lot of doctors, hospitals now, orthopedic surgeons, neurosurgeons, refer to our clinics because they say, doc, we don't know what else to do with this person. We're stuck. Can your doctors take a look at them and see if you could help them? My answers are, yeah, of course we'll look at them. In most cases, we get amazing results. So off to my, uh, my topic of head to toe with Dr. Joe, back to our topic, women's health. First, let's start with how hormones can dictate a woman's life. James Dobson is an author explains it so well in a book called Bringing Up Girls. I don't usually plug other authors, but Do Dr. Dobson did an amazing job with that. And this one segment, I want to cover this because it's so, it explains so nicely how uh, women's hormones work week to week. First, the monthly cycle and how it influences the female mind and the body. Now note, every woman is different. Some individuals experience and exhibit these characteristics more than others. I'm not picking on anyone. I'm just giving you the facts. The description that we're gonna talk about uh, is also more typical of adolescents and younger women than those who are more mature. Uh, this, however, is the way the system usually works. The first week after the menstrual cycle might be considered springtime. Dr. Dobson calls it springtime. Estrogen levels are at the, on the rise. They're producing surging amounts of energy, ambition, optimism. The world looks great. Uh, they have an upbeat mood. The neurotransmitters in the brain, including serotonin, dopamine, norepinephrine, are more active. They facilitate thought, they facilitate memory, intellectual capability. It's the most pleasant time of the month. This is the week after the menstrual cycle stops. So you'll see uh, if, if you're around people and you'll notice that, gosh, she's in a really good mood today. Well, it could be because of the hormones. Now, that's springtime. Summertime arrives during the second week of the menstrual month. Estrogen reaches its peak and then it levels off. The pubescent or the adolescent girl in this phase remains energetic but she starts to pace herself a little bit more. Uh, she's still confident, she's still creative, she's depending on, uh, depending on circumstances, of course. Uh, she might be euphoric. It takes a great deal to upset and worry her at this point. Again, second week after the cycle. Uh, she wishes every day could be like this, these great days where she feels wonderful. But alas, uh, that is gonna soon become a memory because estrogen is about to take a nosedive. So first week after the cycle, estrogen goes up, Women are happy, they're joyous, they're excited, they, they really get ambitious. Second week after the cycle, still great. But now we start going into the third week and this is where the problems come in. Now, I'm not saying problems, issues. Now, you also start to ovulate at that time. And again, the whole point of this is we're designed to procreate. And so the body is doing all these cycles of hormones so that the body can be prepared to get pregnant. And then what a cycle is, is at the end of the cycle, you're not pregnant, the lining of the uterine wall sloughs off, that's a menstrual cycle, and then it prepares again for the next cycle to get ready to get pregnant. So now comes the third week. It's about mid-cycle, and during the start of the third week, young women experience ovulation, and it's her time of fertility. Estrogen levels start to rebound for a few days. These developments coincide with her peak sexual desire. It's also during this week that she feels deep devotion, affection, closeness to a boy or a man that she's uh, close to her in her life. So if you're a father, gentlemen, pay attention to this because you can figure out where it's going. People say, oh, teenagers are crazy. We don't know what to expect from them. You now know what to expect with them. 
And, and if you're a father, a woman is going to start to bond with you. You'll find that teenage girls then will maybe take your arm when you're walking. Uh, they'll want to be with you. They want to spend more time with you. Now, what's happening is they're bonding to a male because of reproductive capabilities. Now, of course, it's not with a father or brother or something like that, but they, the hormones are raging. And they're saying, okay, this is where I want to be. I want to be cuddly. I want to be warm. Uh, and that's what happens. Now, ladies, you've got to be careful at this time of the month because this is the time of the month when you're most likely to get pregnant. It's also the time of the month when you want to cuddle more. It's nature's way of saying, go make babies. So please be careful. And you can chart this. And uh, ra raised as a Catholic, uh, I was taught something called the rhythm method. And the rhythm method was you figured out how many days your cycle was, count back 14 days, that's probably the day you're going to ovulate. And then with the rhythm method, you're supposed to avoid romantic engagement three days after and three days before that day, 14 days from the date of your when your cycle is supposed to start, and that's called the rhythm method. It is not a very good, effective birth control method. So I do not recommend you use this. Now, you can use it in conjunction with other methods because it does tell you when your hormones are peaking and when you're more likely to be fertile, so it's okay to use in conjunction but not instead of. So if you use this with other birth control methods, we have time, we'll cover the, the pros and the cons of different birth control methods, then you can say, okay, I like this, I don't like this, okay? And you can use these other methods, but it's a good idea to incorporate this as well. So two hormones that are influencing the production uh, the, and producing these responses, the first is testosterone. Now, most people think of testosterone as the male sex hormone, and the other is progesterone. This is the bonding hormone. Now, progesterone makes a girl feel close to the one she believes loves her, she can say, uh, say with a smile that there's, there's a, a conspiracy out there at work that's going to ensure the propagation of the human race. And that's exactly what it is. It's a, it's a nat it's, nature's conspiring against you to make sure that there's more people on the earth. Now, you and I would not have existed without these cycles. Progesterone levels continue to rise at this time. This hormone uh, has primary, fun this primary function is related to fertility. First, it counteracts the influence of estrogen. Conception cannot occur in the presence of high levels of estrogen. Second, progesterone produces what we call fertile soil. It thickens the uterine lining. And when it comes, and so what happens is as the uterine lining becomes thicker, it's able to accept a fertilized egg, it, it kind of like a, it's a, a garden, and you're able to implant the fertilized egg in the, in the lining. And so we're so far so good. Everything's good. Now comes the final week. Estrogen levels continue to plummet in this fourth week. So do progesterone, so do the endorphins. As a result, a girl's mood may become darker. She may become more within herself. Now, these hormonal changes are very toxic to the brain and can create depression, a foreboding, a low self-esteem, hypersensitivity, sadness, anger. Also, she typically feels unloved and insecure. This may be a sense that she's in a fog. Uh, she may walk into a room, not remember what she's doing there. Uh, even her performance in school can be affected. So she's experiencing the symptoms known around the world as PMS, premenstrual syndrome. Now, again, different women are affected differently, but this is how the cycles go. Science of how the, four, the cycles go week to week. Uh, it's in the following, uh, it's an advantage of the three days uh, for the period, but what hap it, this can happen because the period's coming and this can cause cramping and bloating and fatigue. It also ends the fourth week cycle. And it's followed quickly by a surge of estrogen and return to the good times. Now, if you actually chart this on a calendar, you can predict what to expect and what to do. So I know you can say this to somebody and say, uh, they may get mad at you. They may get upset saying, no, absolutely not. I'm perfectly fine all the time. You're not. Men go through this too. I'm going to do men's hormones coming up soon, so don't worry. But if you sit down and you say, okay, this is where my cycle is. My cycle ends here. I go into a week of happiness, estrogen levels are high, estrogen levels, levels off in phase two, and week two, phase, week three, you're getting ready uh, to, have the, uh, to get pregnant. If you're not pregnant, then phase four is when you have your menstrual cycle. If we have time, I'm going to talk about menstrual cramps as well, and I, I don't know if I'm going to, so let me cover it right now. When the uterus is ready to slough off its lining, called the cycle, the muscles can cramp in the uterus, and that can cause a lot of menstrual cramps. Now, we can take medication for that, and that might work, but medication, all medications have side effects. I'm not against medication. If I get a blazing headache, I'm going to take some acetaminophen, but then I'm going to go get adjusted with one of my doctors to get to the cause of why I have the headache. In this case, it might be a chemical reaction, not a physical reaction. And so we can help with the chemicals. 
Certain foods are going to make the problem worse, the cramping and, and the menstrual cycle. Any type of stimulant, coffee, tea, chocolate, not a good idea. Now, chocolate has phenylethylamines in it. Phenylethylamines are a chemical that's found in your brain, and they make you feel like you're in love. So many times when we feel depressed or lonely or sad, we crave chocolate. So if you're going to do chocolate, here's the thing. Small amount of dark organic chocolate. When I say small amount, about the tip of your thumb. That's all you need, folks. Take a little bit, men and women. It's going to give you the phenylethylamines, and you're going to start to feel good. When you start to cramp, a couple of things. Number one, as a chiropractor, I always find pinched nerves in the low back with women that have menstrual cramps. So the nerves in the low back, as they come out of the spine, control your back, hips, legs, knees, and ankles, but they also control your colon, your sex organs, and your bladder. So oftentimes when women have cramps, we adjust their low back, it opens up the nerve supply into the uterus, and things settle down. Number two, there's an acupuncture point that you can rub that works wonders for cramps. And it's going to be hard for me to kind of explain this to you, but Matt, you got your feet. And on the inside of your foot, you got your ankle. It's called the medial malleolus, that bump right there. Go to that bump, put your thumb on that bump, go down, just kind of roll off it, and then go back just a little bit. Poke around until you find a sore spot. You will find a sore spot, I promise you. That's the acupuncture, the reflex point to the uterus. So take that point and you can rub it really hard for about 30 seconds. Then do the other foot. And in most cases, the cramps relieve uh, almost instantly. So you got to adjust the low back, straighten out the diet, and then uh, rub that point. And it's amazing how quickly these things go away. And I've been doing this for years, teaching women this. And they say, Dr. Joe, why didn't somebody teach me this sooner? I wish when I was a teenager, when I was a young adult, my life would have been so much easier. Because here's the trick, girls. You can just sit there, you know, cross your leg, kind of like you're sitting on your foot and rub your ankle. Nobody knows you're doing it. And it works really, really well without the negative side effects of meds. Now, if you need the medication, absolutely take the medication. But if you can do it without the medication, that's always my goal. I try to get to the cause of the problems, not just treat the symptoms. And you'll find, I promise you, when you change your diet, when you eat more fruits and vegetables, nuts and seeds, stay away from the alcohol, meat, sugar, dairy, coffee, soda, artificial sweetener, the stimulants like teas and chocolates, you'll be amazed how much better these cycles are and how you'll feel good throughout. Because again, you're going through the cycles, it's nature's way of making sure that we procreate, you can be messing up your hormones. So be careful with that. We have time today, I'm gonna to talk about other things that you can do to mess up your hormones as well, and I want you to stop that. So before we leave this subject of hormones that come into play at this time, there's another secretion that is, all, is also a little mischievous on its influence. It's called oxytocin. You guessed it, it's stimulated by estrogen, and it's called the cuddle hormone. Now you can figure out where this leads to. When a girl gets uh, to know a fellow or a guy or whoever their partner is, gotta be politically correct in these days, you might wanna feel safe with that person. Your oxytocin levels rise and it gives you a rush of hope, of trust, of optimism, of confidence, and a feeling that uh, her needs are being met. Now she may start to fall in love with this person or something that feels like love for a while, but not because this person is the perfect human being, because this person is perceived this way because she starts feeling that way because of oxytocin. Hugging, snuggling, this causes oxytocin levels to surge as well. And so what do you want to do? You want to have more hugging and snuggling. So this is important. When you hug someone, if you hug someone for up to 20, 20 seconds, the oxytocin is released. Oxytocin is the bonding neurotransmitter. Oxytocin is released when a woman's breastfeeds. Now, I always believe that this is nature's way of making sure that we don't uh, get rid of our children, because I'm sure my mother would have got rid of me. Uh, because when you breastfeed, the oxytocin is released and it bonds you to the child. And so even though you, those parents out there, you know it gets crazy sometimes. Uh, well, if you're breastfeeding, that's another reason to breastfeed, it releases the oxytocin. When a woman is uh, romantic, women will release oxytocin as a bonding hormone. Oh, the bonding neurotransmitter, it's a hormone. But here's the thing. People say, it's, uh, there's a great song by Joe Jackson, it's different for girls, if you're old enough to remember Joe Jackson. And, it, and the song, it's different for girls. It is different for girls because women are more likely to release more oxytocin. And especially if there's hugging, if there's cuddling, if there's romance involved, women will release oxytocin, men not so much. So women will bond differently than men. Women will be more attached than men. And it's because of this little sneaky hormone called oxytocin. So let me clarify what I implied a little earlier. This biochemistry is designed to guarantee the continuation of the human race with hormones, receptor sites, brain wiring, neurotransmitters, it effectively carries impulses from cell to cell. Oxytocin is a powerful component of this whole apparatus. So for an experiment on hugging, it's known that oxytocin is naturally released from the brain after 20 seconds of hugs, which we talked about, 
from a partner uh, sealing the bond between huggers and, and, tr and triggering brain uh, circuits to like these persons, like, like these people. So don't let somebody hug you unless you plan on trusting them. It's a little lesson here. Now, uh, I remember taking a, a class, a men's group, a while ago, and it was amazing. It changed my life. It was amazing. And one of the things that the instructor made us do is he made us hug everybody in the class for 20 seconds, about five or 10 guys. And as a man, that's a little awkward for a lot of us. A lot of us have this weird phobia about hugging men or touching men. And he says, I want you to get over this. And he made us hug every guy in the room for about 20 seconds. And now I realize if he, whether he knew it or not, we were releasing oxytocin. When we hug these, doesn't matter who you're hugging. And so the oxytocin is released, so we bonded to these people. Interesting little twist there. So we can now play uh, with our emotions by playing with our hormones. Side note, oxytocin is wonderfully important in development of maternal attachments. Mothers are flooded with, with the stuff during labor. We talked about when nursing. One of the reasons they connect so, so ferociously to their babies uh, before they even know anything about them, well, there's a squirmy ball of mess, uh, is because of the oxytocin. Now, live-in fathers whose partners are pregnant experience elevated oxytocin too. It's child rearing. It's nature's way of saying if you're around a pregnant woman, it's your baby, so nature says you're going to start releasing oxytocin so you do bond to this child. So powerfully oxytocin that a stranger, they did a study on this, a stranger who merely walks in line, in the line of fire, can seem appealing. This one study, I had to throw this in here before we move on. An aide who was not involved with the birth of the baby would stand in the hospital room when the mother was in labor. Had nothing to do with the labor, never said a word. The mothers later reported they found that person very sympathetic, even though that aide, in this case women, had nothing to do with the, with the, with the birth at all. So just being near somebody, when the oxytocin is released, you can bond to them. It's really interesting, and I'm sure that happens in nature too, where they bond immediately. Like they say you know, a, a bird will bond to the first thing it meets. It's probably that oxytocin as well. I've never seen studies on animals. So the oxytocin, powerful hormone, be careful with it because it can mess with your emotions. I'm in love. Well, maybe you're an oxytocin. And so maybe start to step back and uh, think rationally. Wait a couple of weeks. My mother always said, never get married until four seasons because then you know how the person is in winter, spring, summer, and fall. My mother, brilliant woman. She gets so, such great advice she gave over the years. But she said, never get married, never move in with somebody, never even get engaged until four seasons because you have to find out what they're like. And it's interesting that the four weeks could be you know, cl classified as seasons if you wanted to. So it's really important to get to know somebody and be careful because when you first meet somebody, you're in that oxytocin stage. You're in a dopamine stage, I call it. And the first six months, you're in a dopamine stage. Everything they do is wonderful. Everything is so cute. Everything is great. Oh my gosh, I love this person. I used to date this girl, Valerie, and she said, the thing you love about the person when you meet them will be the thing you hate about them when you break up with them. And it's an interesting point. You get excited. You're in the oxytocin phase and the dopamine phase, and then you kind of phase out. Well, dopamine is first, and then oxytocin, if it's a healthy relationship, oxytocin goes up and you bond to that person. So the craziness, the silliness, the giddiness, that starts to fade, and the oxytocin is the remaining bonding neurotransmitter. So we really are victims of our hormones. And it really is important you understand how they work. And it's okay to chart these things. There's nothing wrong with it. Gosh, okay, this week I feel this. This week I feel this. This week I feel this. And for men too, we're going to cover this in the men's section. We're going to cover soon. You can do it, guys. And you can say, maybe this isn't the right time to make a big decision. Maybe this isn't the right time to uh, fight with somebody. I'm going to be in a bad mood. I know. I chart myself. And I know this is not a good week for me. Maybe this isn't the right time that I should be making major decisions in life. You're fired. You're hired. Let's take a break. Let it go through. Now, now that that's uh, about what, what's really interfering with women's hormones, uh, female hormone imbalances are often tied uh, to lifestyle changes. Your lifestyle is a major player in many aspects of your health, and that includes keeping your hormones balanced. Now, folks, when I come back, I'm going to talk about how lifestyle affects your hormones. If you have a healthcare problem, if you have neck pain, back pain, shoulder pain, numbness, tingling, uh, digestive issues, nutrition problems, if you just want to talk to us to get well, I want you to make an appointment to come see us. In the Atlanta area, we have offices in Marietta, Duluth, and Stockbridge. We would love to be your doctors. Now, I know this show goes all over the world, so if you're not in the area, you can, we can always do a phone consultation with you, and we can do a nutritional evaluation, talk about lifestyle with you, and try to get you well. So if you're sick and tired of being sick and tired, if you have these problems, neck pain, back pain, if you've ever been in a car accident, ever, if the car was damaged, you were damaged 100% of the time. You are not stronger than your car. Go to the website right now, drjoe.com, make an appointment. Every day, 
every single day in my practice, patients come in and say, Dr. Joe, I've been listening to you for two years, five years, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, and I've been meaning to make an appointment. And I finally did. Don't be one of those people. Don't wait and say, why didn't I do this sooner? Right now, go to the website, drjoe.com. You can book an appointment right online. Again, offices in Marietta, Duluth, and Stockbridge. We work with most major medical insurances. We try to match the coverage you have, even if we're in network, out of network. Uh, car accidents, folks, I cannot stress enough. Come see us. Patients come to us every day. And I, I do an x-ray. Gosh, you have a lot of arthritis. What happened 20 years ago? I was in a car accident. The bones are out of place. They have to wear out. Folks, I'm Dr. Joe Esposito. Again, the website, drjoe.com. Thanks for listening to For the Health Fit. Remember to subscribe to this podcast, and I'll help you naturally get well and stay well. You can also listen to and call into my radio show live Sunday evenings from 7 to 9 Eastern Time on wsbradio.com and on a WSB Radio app.